let's well, let's talk. You know what else? You know what else happened this week? I did not prep you with this. Here's my random, um, fun stuff from the week. Did you watch the Starship launch? SpaceX's <laughs> Starship. Uh, I watched the Starship have a sudden deconstruction event. The explosion when it started spinning out of control. Yes. Uh, yeah. Did you start watching it with the launch? The launch was impressive. Uh, I didn't watch the whole thing. I just watched the highlights. I think uh, there's a couple of videos out on YouTube. Like this official SpaceX channel has one that's about an hour long. I think it's 52, 53 minutes, minutes, something like that. Yeah, it is. And I watched it like the kids came in and watched it with me. It was... It was fascinating. It was way slower than I thought it would be. Um, <laughs> because what well, it's 33 engines. So the Falcon 9 has the nine engines. Starship had 33. And I was talking to someone else about this. And they it's a slow liftoff because they slowly light all the engines. They don't want to ignite all 33 engines at once. So they like hold it down in the pad for longer while they slowly ignite all of them. And then they finally let it go. But I was sitting here watching it I'm like, is it going to go? Is it going to go? And it was super slow to start going. <laughs> it felt like this behemoth. Just you slowly saw it start moving. Um, yeah, it, it, it's it's interesting. So uh, it, it caused some damage to the pad. I mean, like the, the thing did. Huge. I was looking at the YouTube, like the crater. It literally made a, like a new crater underneath the pad. Yeah, uh, they also had a bunch of holding tanks. Uh, it looks like some of those got uh, some some pretty good dents in them. Like like as whatever was whatever pressurized like, gas was in them, kind of uh, suck things in. Almost like you get a dent on your car that you look like you could go back and pull out later. But I mean, these uh -huh. are massive holding tanks for you know whatever liquid nitrogen or, or you know whatever gas they have in there. So uh, yeah, it's impressive if you're into the space geekery thing. It's definitely. Uh, it, it's definitely worth catching up on if you haven't had a chance to, even if you just put it on in the background. It was. The kids had fun watching it. The kids spotted right away, too, that something was wrong. Like, it took off and it started going and they were saying everything was nominal, looking great. And then one of the kids was like, Dad, is it supposed to be, like, upside down in the air? And it's like, <laughs> I don't know if that's the camera angle. And then it was right side up and then it was upside down again. And the kids were like, Dad, I don't think it's supposed to be spinning like that. And then, yes, yeah, sure enough, a few minutes later, there was no stage separation and everything went kablooey. Yeah. Well, uh, I think the thing to keep in mind is the point of it was to see if they could get it off the ground and take off without yes. destroying the entire pad. Uh, I, I, you know, it was never meant to go all the way to space or anything like that on that launch. So it, it really was a test and seeing what's viable and what they can learn from it. Uh, kind of interesting that we have to blow things up at that scale to figure out what's going to work and what's not going to work. And we can't just, you know, turn on one of these uh, AI, ML, blah, 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 model things and have it figure it out for us. But uh, kind of fun that you get to see stuff blow up at that scale. Really fun for a it pyrotechnics really engineer. Yes, I was I was just disappointed it was down in Texas or over in Texas and not here in Florida so that I couldn't actually see it. Um, but... Who knows? Hopefully, eventually, maybe they'll launch them from Florida. I'm assuming that would be the goal eventually. But based on what it did to the launch pad, I don't know if they're going to end up having to build new launch pads or how that's going to work out. But it'll be interesting to watch as they continue on with it. Yeah, uh, my understanding is the goal isn't necessarily to be able to launch from Florida. Like Those likely always go from Texas and, and from that Texas. facility okay. because of the size of them. Like They're there's a huge environmental impact and it's it's i mean it's it's a real impact where it is now too like even the texas facility is surrounded by uh protected lands and wildlife and all sorts of things that are being sacrificed along the way as well um so it, it's no good whether it launches from texas or florida like really florida. you shouldn't be launching it from the surface of the earth but hey that's where we are and what we've got to do with its 10 million pounds of fuel. Yes. That was the number that blew me away when I heard that. I'm like, 10 million pounds of fuel? That is a lot of fuel. 
Yep. It's, uh, um, it's, it's there. It's got it going on. So, um, yeah, highly recommend anybody go watch it. Like I said, if you're th- throw it up on the TV, like it's a good one to watch on like YouTube on your TV, or if you can cast it over and just run the, you know, uh, the 4k feed through and crank up the speakers. It's got some good rumble yes. and things on it. Make sure you have a good sub too. Yeah. Good subwoofer, turn up the bass and let it shake the house. By the time it exploded, though, it was too far away that you're not going to get any good audio from the explosion. It's going to be the launch itself. Yes, uh, I will put a link in the show notes to the official uh, SpaceX uh, YouTube channel where where they've got it. You're going to want to skip to about 44 minutes in if you're just looking for kind of lift off and, and not all the launch prep, but other things that go with it. Yeah, definitely. So, you know what else is happening, Scott? This what else is, is not happening, happening today, nor did it happen this week, although more news came out about it this week. I don't when, know when all the blog posts were posted. Some of these were back in February 16. Um, one of these I saw was by uh, Laura Rogers, just yesterday, but something near and dear to our hearts, Scott. SharePoint 2013 workflows are being turned off for newly created tenants in Office 365. And this is happening on April 2nd of 2024. Apparently, they did not want this to be on April 1st, and people think it was an (laughs) April Fool's joke, maybe. I don't know, but April 2nd, 2024, SharePoint 2013 workflows will no longer be a thing in newly created tenants starting April 2nd of 2026. So you have some time here, like three years time frame. You have some time if you're in an existing tenant. If you're in an existing tenant, that's when you're going to just lose them altogether in existing tenants. So three years from now, give or take a couple weeks, no more SharePoint 2013 workflows at all in any tenants in Microsoft 365. Yeah, I wonder if this changes. We've talked a little bit in the past about uh, merger and acquisition scenarios, particularly around tenants and merging tenants and SharePoint and Exchange and and all these different things. I wonder if this impacts M and A at all in meaningful ways. Like if you acquire a company and you want to spin up a whole new tenant to kind of converge everything in, and now all of a sudden you're in a spot where oh, you can't do that <laughs> because you don't have this critical component that's in use. Uh, I, I think things like this always lead to interesting customer behaviors, and that you. Have customers latch on to things like quote unquote legacy tenants, legacy, you know, big air quotes, uh, yeah. so that they can retain these features over time. Um, sh- should be a uh, should be a fun one to watch, but uh, yeah, so uh, it, it's, it's 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 time to migrate from your old. Uh, they would still be SharePoint designer workflows, right? Like, yes, yeah, they are. Like this is one of those products. SharePoint designer twenty thirteen is the latest version of SharePoint Designer. I don't believe they ever did a SharePoint Designer 2016 um, or 2017 or anything after 2013. They just kind of kept extending the life of SharePoint Designer so you could continue to run these workflows. Um, I mean, personally, I'm... Frankly, I'm surprised it made it this long. Like, you talk about mergers and acquisitions, you talk about people migrating... I mean, all of my clients for quite a while now, when they start talking about migrating to SharePoint Online from SharePoint On-Premises, one of my questions is, do you have workflows? And tell you what, let's not migrate those into SharePoint Online. Let's actually rewrite them as Power Automate flows. And I've done a few of those where it's coming from SharePoint, whether it's a legacy or I don't know that I've actually done any like 2019 to SharePoint Online. Most of them are 2013, 2016 to SharePoint Online. And it has been, let's break down these SharePoint designer workflows. Let's rewrite them in Power Automate uh, and go that way. And it's it's interesting because there are definitely things you need to take into consideration. 
uh, when you start migrating these things that don't necessarily work in Power Automate the same way they do in SharePoint Designer and even different ways. Uh, like I think SharePoint Designer workflows, SharePoint workflows, you could do like or a workflow that triggered another workflow. Um, Power Automate, that's not as easy to do. So again, just things you need to think about and work through. So not something you necessarily want to save until the last minute. Um, if you do have a bunch of old SharePoint designer workflows running in your environment. Um, or I suppose you could write these in Visual Studio. I suppose it's not just SharePoint designer, right? You used to be able to crack open Visual Studio and actually compile these and uh, write workflows that way. I'm remembering right. Uh, yes, uh, I used to make my living doing that. <laughs> it, <laughs> it's it's something that can definitely be done. Um, so uh, this one's interesting in that there's not like a straight migration path. Uh, you know, like Microsoft doesn't have today, uh, uh, unless I've completely missed it, tooling to take a SharePoint 2013 workflow and migrate it over to something like Power Automate. Are you aware of anything that Microsoft has or are there ISVs that are filling this space? Is somebody maybe like uh, Nintex coming in with their workflow engine and saying like, hey, we'll take your stuff on, come in, migrate to us and keep on running? I have not heard of anything like that. Um, it wouldn't surprise me if maybe Nintex has something or some ISV has the ability if you want to go from SharePoint. I don't know if we call them SharePoint Classic. Microsoft tends to use SharePoint Classic workflows. Like going to SharePoint Classic workflows to Nintex would probably work. Um, I don't know that any ISV has like use our tool as uh, a proxy or a pass through to go from classic workflows to Power Automate. Um, so it really is kind of a manual process if you're going from classic to Power Automate. Uh, again, there are others. There's Nintex. Um, trying to remember, I feel like there were a couple others and I can't remember what they are. Nintex was always the big one. But even then, I have not run across very many people that still do Nintex with SharePoint Online. I mean, real-time follow-up, Nintex unveils workflow plan amid Microsoft retiring product. So uh, they will offer a transition plan. Interesting. Well, that Inclu go... including it, including in GovClouts and, and DoD. Oh. Which uh, See, and I wonder if this stuff is very, is very prevalent over there. I can tell you that much. Yeah, and I wonder if that's why I don't encounter it. I wonder if it's much more prevalent in some of those more regulated industries. I know for a long time, Power Automate and Power Apps weren't even available in like GovCloud and some of those. So I can see where, yeah, maybe you migrate some of these classic ones to Nintex or maybe there's people using Nintex already in those and they're just going to have to migrate some of these. Uh, the best thing I found in Microsoft, they do have an article here on guidance. Migrate from classic workflows to power automate flows in SharePoint. And they walk through kind of how you should think about it, uh, pain points you may encounter, uh, modern approval stuff, authoring, um, workflow concepts, and how some of them are different for different for example something that causes your workflow to start in sharepoint workflow with start options and events power automates triggers both of them have act actions um things like conditions that are the same um but then different types of workflows different sharepoint integrations triggers actions uh it's quite an extensive list kind of more doing a compare and contrast and highlighting a few pain points that you may encounter as you start that transition from classic workflows to Power Automate flows. Yeah, so there, there's also some tooling out there. So Microsoft has the M365 assessment tool that can kind of help you just figure out 
what's in use today because uh, you, you might not know in your environment. So that's probably a good place for most customers to start is like, what's the impact of this announcement on me? Do I have one of these? Do I have a thousand of these? Like what's going on? Where are they running? What uh, sites, site collections are they running in? And start to kind of wrap your head around just, you know, what's the blast radius uh, for, for this announcement coming through so you can plan around it. Yeah, you mean there's people that have SharePoint environments that have no idea what's going on in it? <laughs> I, I, isn't that like every SharePoint online Ooh. administrator? <laughs> I don't know how anybody's isn't that keeping like up with every it. Every SharePoint administrator anywhere. I think it was just as prevalent with SharePoint on prem as it was with SharePoint online, except there at least you had some control over like the WSPs and some of that, maybe ish. Uh, so you're, yeah, you're, you're taking be... me back to the good old days when I used to maintain a CodePlex project for uh, WSP extraction. I, I I actually wrote one of those, like it's just like a WinForms app to go ahead and go into SharePoint Farms and uh, pull out WSPs from existing solutions that had been deployed. And uh, yeah, uh, yeah, I used I to be a developer in a past life. <laughs> That was before we did this. I don't know that I ever put two and two together. Although I don't know that I ever used your solution. I used a PowerShell script to extract WSPs from SharePoint on-prem. Uh, there was also yes. a little PowerShell so script I, I, out there. I, I, that used to, I used to deal with customers who uh, you know, didn't understand the complexities or want to run PowerShell. So it was a nice little... Uh, it was a nice little... Uh, you know, WSP downloader kind of thing. Got it. Yeah, I, excuse me, have very fond memories of pulling out WSPs before you do migrations so you could redeploy them or people that needed to rebuild a farm and didn't bother saving the WSPs and you needed to back them up somewhere. Um, there was many a time I was extracting WSPs from SharePoint farms. <laughs> yeah uh, that's oh. a thing we used to do the good old days so, along with SharePoint Farm since we moved to SharePoint on-prem and WSPs and we're talking about workflows there was also some guidance and this was a little bit older back in mid February of this year so about a month ago where there was an announcement from it was on Stephen Gobner. I think it's how you pronounce his last name. His website, uh, Bill Bear, also has like the official release announcement blog post of this is the release of SharePoint Workflow Manager for SharePoint Server. Um, and this is 100% based on premises because obviously power automate can't run in on premises farms because it's all cloud only so you're still going to have to support some form of workflows on premises servers um so everything we just talked about around sharepoint designer workflows will still work as far as i can tell in sharepoint on premises but the Microsoft Workflow Manager that we have known and loved and used alongside of Service Bus since the SharePoint 2013 days is going to go away on July 14 of 2026. So the same rough three-year-ish time frame and be replaced with SharePoint Workflow Manager, a new workflow engine to power SharePoint 2013 workflows, 16 workflows, 2019 workflows, and SharePoint subscription edition workflows. Um, all the workflows. All the workflows. I have my speculations on what this is. It doesn't say anywhere in here. I haven't seen any official documentation. Um, my theory is is that they're kind of taking the Microsoft Workflow Engine and Service Bus and kind of combining them into one product, re-releasing it as the SharePoint Workflow Manager, and this is going to be maintained by the SharePoint team. 
instead of Microsoft Workflow Manager, which could be used with SharePoint, but was really a bigger Microsoft product that you could also use outside of it. Looks like maybe the SharePoint team has kind of taken this over. Uh, similar to what happened with is it distributed cash. One of those, there was another product that the SharePoint team was using that Microsoft discontinued, but like the SharePoint team kind of picked it up and ran with it to keep it working in SharePoint. This yes. So this one's not service bus, at least going by the documentation. So it can't be installed over the top of existing uh, sh- uh, uh uh, workflow manager. So workflow manager being service bus oriented, this one requires uh, IIS still, uh, but it also requires Azure service fabric and kind of the on-prem components of service fabric coming in. So it is a little bit of an underlying change, but it gives you kind of warm fuzzies as you're moving forward. If you're still on-prem today and you're running you know, whatever version of SharePoint, like hopefully it's subscription edition, but, uh, you know, if you're running subscription edition, it gives you, and, and some of the older versions, it gives you that warm fuzzy about being able to move forward, uh, along the way. So, uh, I will put a link to the installation documentation in the show notes and everybody can go have a look at that, but there it's, it's fairly comprehensive. Uh, in what you need to do to potentially uninstall uh, existing uh, Microsoft Workflow Manager and then get the... uh, or No, I'm sorry, existing what SharePoint Workflow Manager and then get the new uh, Workflow Manager up and running. It doesn't help that one's Microsoft Workflow Manager and one's SharePoint Workflow Manager. Like, Right, like you can't really just say Workflow Manager. It's both. Um. I'm assuming I was looking through some of this documentation. Is this set up and configure SharePoint workflow manager overview? I'm assuming you do still author these with SharePoint designer. Yeah. SharePoint designer 2013 is a workflow authoring tool of choice for SharePoint workflows. Some advanced tasks require the intervention of a developer using Visual Studio. Um, Yeah, under the documentation for SharePoint Workflow Manager, it is still all Visual Studio and SharePoint Designer 2013. Um, Yes, uh, there's some underlying restrictions there, like things have changed in the new workflow engine. So... The setup account can't be used to create workflows, which you shouldn't be doing anyway. I don't think that's too no, there uh, were too too big always, a deal. Um, SPD is still there and running. Triggering. I remember issues with triggering whenever you did it with that farm account or install account too. So, yep. anyways, sorry. What else? Uh, no, I think that's the big one. Um, it does require. Uh, so Azure Service Fabric, IIS, it also requires that the SQL Server instance that hosts Workflow Manager databases, it does have to run the SQL Browser service. So, you know, you might have restrictions or just kind of rules around whether you actually run the browser service within your org, like it's a requirement for this. So maybe that kind of impacts topology or where you place it or or where it lives. But other than that, it looks pretty straightforward uh, uh, along the way. Um Users that run workflows need to be in the user profile service uh, and and users that author workflows like that all makes sense. Uh, Yeah. And then from there, the the tooling's the same. So, you know, if you haven't already just install SharePoint Designer 2013 then go ahead and create a workflow based on the SharePoint 2013 workflow platform and you're up and running. Yeah, I wonder if SharePoint Designer is ever going to go away. Um, <laughs> one thinks it like has to is... at some point, uh, but who, who, who really knows? You would think at this point in time, though, it's extended date has like its date keeps getting extended. It's extended end date is now 2026. So this now is up to a 13 year 
life cycle if you're going to take extended support into account. Um, it's interesting, though, looking at the SharePoint Designer life cycle, that extended end date of July 14, 2026, is the exact same date as the end date for Microsoft Workflow. Um, I have no idea if anything new is coming or not, but interesting that they are the exact same date for that end of life. Yeah, uh, we'll see where it all goes. I, I think the other thing to remember is if you are an on-prem SharePoint customer today, or maybe if you're a hybrid customer and you're kind of looking at what's going on on SharePoint in Office 365 and the online versions of it versus what you're doing on-prem, like we talked about the whole transition from legacy workflows to Power Automate earlier, you can run Power Automate uh, on-prem as well, but you're not really running it on-prem, but you can integrate Power Automate workflows into your Power Automate flows into your environment uh, by using the on-prem data gateways and things like that. There might be licensing implications for you there, like Power Apps Plan 1 licenses, uh, you know, or, or higher Um but uh, yeah, might be something that right. you want to take a look at. I think your decision is probably down to like the whole interactive versus non-interactive workflow thing and, and what that's going to look like for you. So I, I don't think Power Automate really works for like interactive workflows through a gateway. Like it's a weird experience uh, and pretty janky. You might just want to go with the, uh, the older style workflow or I guess the older style workflow on the new workflow engine. <laughs> They're making this really easy. Yeah, and even if you're okay with data going up to the cloud, right? Because if you start integrating Power Automate with SharePoint on-prem, I mean, maybe you're still on-prem for licensing reasons, but if you're on-prem for security reasons because you don't or you can't have your SharePoint data in the cloud, uh, you probably don't want to integrate with Power Automate because it's going to start sucking that data out of your on-premises environment into the cloud to run the workflow and maybe then shove it back into your on-premises environment. Yeah, like um, I, I, th I think it's a niche thing, right? Like if you're a hybrid customer, you meet the compliance, uh, you know, it's not going to be something for regulated industry probably, but if you're somebody tinier, it might be totally viable for you, if anything, because you don't have to train people on, you know, two different tools versus just get me on the one stack and I'm kind of hopefully future-proofed for the foreseeable future. Yeah, I would be interested to hear from somebody doing this. I personally, I have not run into any customers using SharePoint on-prem and Power Automate or Power Apps in this hybrid type scenario. Um, that day, business data connector, that connection... I've seen it a little bit more from like a Power BI standpoint. They have a big data warehouse on premises. They don't want to migrate it up somewhere. They want to connect and do some reporting in their data on premises. Um, I feel like most of the customers I've run into, if they're going to be using Power Automate and Power Apps, they're also just migrating up to SharePoint Online. So if there is someone doing the whole, we have SharePoint on premises yet, but we're using Power Apps, Power Automate, all these cloud tools with the data gateway, I would be really curious to know use case reasoning, like just learning about what those niche scenarios are that people find themselves in that situation. Um, it would just be really interesting. Let me know because I'm curious. <laughs> uh, you can hit Ben up on all the socials. Send him an email. Yeah, go find me. Send me an email. Send me a tweet. Send me a... What is it if it's on Mastodon? It's a toot. It's a toot? Yeah, see, you asked, but uh, you probably didn't want to know. I did not want to know. I really don't want toots being sent my way. <laughs> uh, yeah. Anywho. Oh, what else good stuff, Scott? I learned a lot of good stuff this past week, but I'm not allowed to talk about any of it, so... Sorry, we sat down and I'm like, I don't know what to talk about because my brain's a whole jumble from this past week of NDA stuff. Um, sorry, you got to wait. It, it, it took you, what, less than a month to go around and start flaunting your MVP status? I see how it is. Yeah, see how that... 
you just flaunt your Microsoft status. I don't have Microsoft status, so I have to flaunt some status. <laughs> uh, I don't know that I flaunt it. I, I, I live it day to day. So uh, I, I, I don't know. Uh, the, the struggle is real there sometimes, for sure. It is. I have found myself having to, every once in a while, make sure I have the blog post or the public announcement in front of me so I know what's been talked about and what hasn't been. Um, yep. It's, yeah, it's interesting. Um, anywho, anything else? Do you want to talk uh, about co-pilots? No, nah, co-pilots <laughs> is probably going to take us a while. Why don't we do co-pilot next week? And there, there's been some you interesting... Said it, not me. I, I did know. not do this. I did not commit. I want everybody to tweet Scott or toot Scott. Do you want to be tweeted or tooted? Uh, <laughs> I, 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 unlike you, I would prefer to be tooted. I don't support Dude the me. lizard overlord over on uh, um, over on the other platform that he burned to the ground. And remind him that he actually committed to something this week or next week and not me this time. But anywho, what were you going to say? Sorry. Uh, no, let's uh, let, let's chat Copilot next week. I think there's some interesting things there uh, in the Copilot service. Uh, I don't think we've talked about Copilot X yet, and uh, what uh, we've got Copilot coming to Viva. So uh, come back next week yes, to hear there more. Are, there are lots of Copilots, lots of different places. So it will be interesting. I'm curious to learn more about your Copilot thoughts next week. All right, we'll do. As always, thanks, Ben. All right. Thanks, Scott. We'll talk to you next week.